Good morning and welcome to the 23rd annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. We've been here for quite some time uh, observing the changes and talking about market potential. If I look back in time, I can see the difference immediately here. The electrolyzer technologies are um, increasingly occupying the floor here and there are specific reasons for that. One of them is the source of renewable energies and the fact that we don't know how to store it yet. Um, on that light, we have um, Dr. Hans-Jörg Fell, who is CTO of Hydrogen Pro in Norway, and he's going to be talking about when size and performance matters, he's launching the world's largest electrolyzer uh, with a store electrical energy in the form of hydrogen. And it's going to be a fanta fantastic talk. Please welcome with me Dr. Hans-Jörg Fell. Thank you, Brian. So Hydrogen Pro is uh, an interesting company. It has a very interesting history and a very interesting partnership. Uh, perhaps you could describe the company, where you're located, and what you people do. Yes, we are a fairly new player in the field. Hydrogen Plow is located in Norway, but we have a very experienced team of uh, experts who have been working in the electrolyzer business for many, many years. Um, our offer to the customer is uh, world-class hydrogen plants and these are based on renowned technology supplied by our partner THE of China. Mm -hmm. THE has uh, been pioneering the market with their high-pressure alkaline electrolyzers since 1994 mm -hmm. and uh, since then they have supplied more than 300 units. We have noticed that the uh, Chinese technology is not so well presented in Europe. Uh, while in, in China there has been a huge commercial market during the last decades, remember, there has been a tremendous upswing in industry activity in, in China and Asia. And uh, every day new power plants come online and every power plant needs uh, hydrogen for the generator cooling. So there has been a big, big market, commercial market, which has driven the electrolyzer development forward. And THE is a renowned supplier of electrolyzer technology in this field. And uh, they offer a large variety of uh, cell stacks based on their alkaline technology. So it's this technology you're bringing finally to Europe. You're launching the world's largest electrolyzer. Um, why is size here an advantage? What is the scale-up advantage uh, that you get from the largest electrolyzer? Yes, uh, size matters when it comes to cost reduction. Mm -hmm. In an electrolyzer plant, you have items which you ne need, no matter what size the cell stack is. So these part of the co total cost will remain. And when you have a larger uh, electrolyzer stack, you can produce more, more uh, hydrogen per unit, and it will re reduce uh, the overall cost for the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Moreover, you get the better energy efficiency, and that's beneficial for the customer. And uh, in terms of initial investment here, and I think this is very important because, in fact, um, there's hesitation um, uh, to jump into the market. We, we could be harvesting far more renewable energy. Um, so the initial investment is a bit huge factor. Uh, do you lower inv initial investment costs through size? Well, to start with, we, we have a very uh, attractive offer to the customer. Mm -hmm. I, um, so, so we are very competitive, and by increasing, increasing the size of the stack, especially for large-scale plants, mm. you use, use uh, fewer stacks, and this will reduce the, uh, ca um, the capex, the investment costs, uh, dramatically. Mm -hmm. On top of that, our technology is very energy efficient, and that has an impact on the OPEX, on the operative cost, operating cost, and um, we have a pressurized system with zero gap uh, technology. And from a performance point of view, it's as good as the PEM system when it comes to 
power supply from intermittent sources like you have from wind or PV. Mm -hmm. And of course, we always have to consider issues like durability, flexibility, flexibility you just mentioned, um, uh, durability, are you satisfied with uh, uh, the performance of your fuel cells and the, 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 the electrolyzers in this case? I, I don't think we have to hide ourselves when it comes to durability. Um, typical lifetime of a cell stack uh, is uh, 10 years and more, and, and that's uh, very important when you can keep the stacks as long as possible before you need replacement. And that's based on the experience during the last decades. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as we were preparing for this talk, you used the category proven. And I think we have to focus on two sides here because, of course, you're a young company, um, but uh, the development and experience of the technology is a long-standing factor, isn't it? That's right, Brian. So, so we have a very close cooperation with our friends in, in China. And they've gradually developed the units, and this large unit we are presenting here is based on well-proven components used before in the plants. So there's no technical risk at all when it comes to come uh, to operation of this plant. Hmm. I think this experience factor is important to stress because, um, um, first of all, there are competitors, um, and uh, there's a big mission. Uh, to perform here. Um, there are industries that are willing to pay a lot of money um, for hydrogen if it's a small part of their overall budget, if it's necessary for industrial processes, but we're talking about competing with conventional fossil fuels. Um, and we're moving up uh, in questions of scale, we're just, uh, it, this is a far larger issue. Um, and uh, the technologies are important, they are going to come, but you've got competition. There are the classic three different types of electrolyzer technologies. There's the solid oxide electrolyzers, um, which are sort of second place in terms of the number of operating units um, in Europe, at least. Um, we have the PEM electrolyzers, which seem to be the most common in terms of numbers. And then we have, again, we're underestimating the experience of uh, China, uh, but it seems to be the least represented and the least discussed are the alkaline. Uh, if you compare the technologies, and let's take the, the, the number one position now. If we compare the PEM electrolysis technology with the alkaline electrolysis technology you offer, uh, let's, let's look at the concrete numbers. What are the advantages of the alkaline system? Yes, first of all, I am the first to acknowledge that PEM has done a tremendous development during the past years. There has been a lot of focus on the PEM technology and it's really impressive what you can see here from the different suppliers. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, well, uh, the alkaline electrolysis has been a sleeping beauty in Europe during the past decades. There has been made little efforts to upgrade uh, this technology. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, what counts for the customer the main drivers are investment costs and operating costs. Let's look at the numbers. Um, our investment costs in such a plant, I, I mentioned it at the elevator pitch the other day, the 800 normal cubic meter plant, a complete plant, um, electrolyzer plant, a bit depending on the configuration, you can get it for 2 million US dollar. Based on that number, we are today at half of the cost, investment cost, for what you have to pay for a PEM electrolyzer. That's very important to notice. And uh, we have not even not looking at large scale plants where you get the economy of scales. I, I suggest that we can reduce the cost for even further 20%. So this is a normal saving when you come to large investments. Mm -hmm. Then we need to look at the operating cost. The number one driver for operating cost is the energy consumption. Mm -hmm. And to this end, the alkaline electrolysis is roughly speaking 20% more efficient than the PEM technology. Mm -hmm. And um, you almost can uh, put it simple way, you can get your PEM stack for free and still you would not make a profit uh, compared to the uh, um, alkaline technology. Mm -hmm. 
these are huge numbers. Um, if you um, half the cost for the initial installation, uh, the barrier for entrance technology is um, half as high. If you uh, save on the operating cost, you bring the cost of the hydrogen within reach of its competitors, which are of course the fossil fuels, which are unfairly Correct. inexpensive. Correct. So these are like this is a huge issue because what we're trying to do basically is not simply power the grid. We're trying to phase out non-renewable fossil fuels. That's correct. And so I find this a, a extremely important message. All of the other factors that we've talked about, and of course this is going into technical details here, but um, when you think of renewables, uh, we always think of the uh, huge problem is that it's a fluctuating source. So the sun can shine for seconds or minutes or the whole day, uh, but it never shines exactly when you need it. Um, or rarely. So the, the, the peak power demand is not synchronized with the uh, best hours of sun. The same thing for wind energy. There's some nice steady winds that um, take place in certain areas, but basically uh, what we're doing now is we're turning the wind turbines off. Um, I don't know whether this is a huge issue, but we do hear a debate about flexibility in terms of is the start up time? That is, if the current starts to flow from a wind turbine, um, should we be worried about whether this device starts in two seconds or 100 milliseconds or five seconds? Um, it, does that sort of flexibility issue um, uh, raise an issue for the alkaline technology by comparison with the PEM, or is it sort of not that important? Well, that's a beautiful side of our pressurized technology. Once started up and pressurized, we can change load from 20 to 100 percent within a second. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the power electronics determining the speed of uh, um, load change. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any disadvantage to that respect. Um, so for s smaller applications uh, connected directly to wind turbines or, or PV cells, this is doable. This is doable. But we are targeting foremost the large scale market where you add. 10, 20, maybe 50 of those large tanks to one huge hundreds of megawatt scale hydrogen plant. Mm -hmm. And then it's clear with so many modules, you, you're evening out fluctuations. And then this becomes not an issue at all. And you won't invest uh, yeah, many hundreds of millions of euros in such a large plant to keep it idle. Mm -hmm. So you will uh, look for strategies how to keep it in operation 24-7. Mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned that the alkaline technology, there's a huge amount of experience in, uh, uh, in China. Um, there's a lack of experience here with these units. Um, does this affect at all the, the uh, I suppose, the argument for the acceptability? Uh, on, against, uh, on practical levels, that is, um, uh, people seem to know how to maintain a uh, PEM electrolyzer. Um, at least enough people who are in the industry, they know how to operate a PEM cell. Um, is there a lack of fundamental knowledge about um, uh, the maintenance, um, uh, the operation of an alkaline technology, or is it really quite a simple thing? Oh, it's pretty much uh, straightforward. Um and, and we also offer service to our customers, so this, this can be, with a bit of training, everybody with a bit technical competence can do that. Mm -hmm. It's not a critical issue. I should add that we do have time for a question. If there's a question from the audience about this technology, um, just raise your hand and uh, we'll try to address it. Certainly. Uh, two things that fascinate me about this technology is it's approaching the level where it's competitive with fossil fuels at the same time. Um, it's going to raise the issue of what we do with the capacity to generate hydrogen in such large quantities. So um, all of the people who are involved in electrolyzer technologies, and particularly a manufacturer who's going big scale, is going to be manufacturing a lot of hydrogen, and the question is, um, where does it go? And you have some ideas about this, the power to X notion, how it gets applied, what happens on the other side. I mean, if you have a customer, that's great, because he's already buying hydrogen anyway, but we're going to have to actually reinvent 
um, what was the electrical grid or the natural gas grid. We have to distribute, we have to utilize. Do you have any visions for the future there? Well, yes, we have uh, many good ideas and uh, it's worthwhile to mention here that uh, Mitsubishi Hitachi Power System Europe, they have screened the electrolyzer market and came back to us and selected us as a joint development partner for specifically these power to x projects. Um, and, and there are lots of opportunities, speci specifically in the Nordic countries where the electricity price is low, it becomes commercially interesting to, to use renewable energy to produce hydrogen and then from there take it further to fuel, synthetic fuel production. Mm -hmm. And uh, there you can come at parity with uh, fossil fuels and, and it is extremely interesting because with these synthetic fuels you can use the existing infrastructure and use it right away, replacing fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. I, I can't resist adding, of course, I'm talking to someone from Norway. Uh, people should know uh, you've got immense resources in fossil fuels, um, and, and yet uh, you're active in this field. Germany is entirely dependent, virtually entirely dependent upon um, uh, fossil fuels. They're criminally cheap, but they're imported in large quantities because they are inexpensive, it's natural gas, it's oil, and this makes the country, of course, entirely dependent upon foreign resources. Uh, it's an irony that somehow a Norwegian would come to Germany and help us solve our problem, which is this addiction to fossil fuels. Is there any lesson in history to be learned by this contrast? Well, I think we are sitting more or less all in the same boat. Uh, it's clear that Norwegian is pioneering the transition when it comes to decarbonizing the transport sector. They are particularly um, successful with their battery car policy. In Germany, you have the energy vendor, and uh, it's impressive what you guys are doing here. And I think there's, in the near future, more and more possibilities to utilize the renewable energy from the up north to produce, um, for instance, synthetic fuels. And the success, I think, will be in integrating different industries, mm -hmm. not just producing hydrogen, but using then uh, CO2 emissions from, from cement industries, for, as a matter of example, and, and combine that to produce new new resources which can be used in other places. And then at the end, you can also decarbonize the chemist, chemical industry. Mm -hmm. Well, as we say in the uh, English language, the gauntlet has been thrown a 50% reduction in um, initial investments to get these things up and running, um, a reduction in the price per kilogram, uh, uh, significant reduction by comparison with the PEM cell technology. This is a wonderful um, opportunity to engage in debate and uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you next year about the great success of this uh, world's largest uh, electrolyzer. Yes, I can, I can also mention that we are not standing still. We have ambitions and we are currently working in a project to even improve our electrode system and we are targeting then a thousand uh, cubic meter cell stack mm -hmm. in the near future. Yeah. Well, come back next year and tell us how it's I going. I will. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I've been talking to Dr. Hans-Jörg Fels, a CTO of Hydrogen Pro in Norway, and uh, it's all about how the larger the better, the effectivity and the lower cost of alkaline electrolyzers. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Hans-Jörg. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And thank you. Um, we will be returning in 35 seconds to talk to John Litterdale, who is from InnoCell, about first light-activated fuel cells with my colleague Uli Walzer.